Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Miller, and I am the Director of Education here at Planet Word. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to be hosting this program. Um, Planet Word, if you have not interacted with us in the past, is a museum in Washington, D.C., dedicated to renewing and inspiring a love of words, language, and reading. In addition to offering our groundbreaking in-person museum experience, we are also pleased to present a variety of virtual and in-person public programming to help people think more deeply about the way words, language, and reading shape our lives. Now, these programs are made possible through the support of people like you who donate to or become members of the museum. This election cycle, Planet Word is offering several programs related to the intersection of words and civic engagement. We are hosting several programs on this series. If you are interested in what we are covering today, you might consider joining us in person at Planet Word on October 6th as CNN commentator Van Jones joins New York Times columnist Tom Friedman in conversation about how Van used the thoughtful language to work across the aisle on prison reform. For this afternoon, allow me to introduce our presenter. Amy McIsaac is the Managing Director for Learning and Experimentation at PACE, or Philanthropy for Active Civic Engagement. Among other responsibilities, Amy leads the Civic Language Perceptions Project, which seeks to understand people's perceptions of the language associated with civic engagement and democracy work. This could not be more timely or relevant as we approach a presidential election a little over two months away. Amy will share insights from their 2024 survey, which I'm sure will be both fascinating and useful as we all seek to engage in constructive political discourse. And without further ado, please welcome Amy. Wonderful. Thank you, Caitlin and the Planet Word team. I'm so excited to be with this community today um, and to share some of our research as it relates to what I know is very much on folks' minds, the 2024 election coming up and uh, which way in which our, our, our civic language is um, shaping that and shaping the world more broadly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my slides so we can walk through it together. And as a place to start, um, I'm going to just give you a quick overview of PACE itself. Caitlin did a little bit of an intro for you, but Philanthropy for Active Civic Engagement, we go by PACE, and we really see ourselves as a philanthropic laboratory for funders. Um, said another way, we have members who are um, part of our organization, all of whom are grant makers and funding institutions. Um, they are investing in a lot of different things with their grant money. Um, but one thing that they're all prioritizing in some way in their grant making is strengthening democracy and civic life in America. And so we help them figure out how to learn on certain topics, how to connect together, how to collaborate on initiatives, um, and just really kind of figure out a way to make a stronger philanthropic base for in support of democracy in the United States. So we have about 80 members um, who work with us. We have been around for about 20 years. And for five of those years, we have been looking at civic language perceptions. Now, that might feel a little niche to most of the rooms I present in, maybe not so much in this room where um, I'd like to lovingly consider us all language nerds in, in, a, in a good way, but definitely our members our funders. Um, this has been a kind of niche area of, of research and focus for them. And the reason that they asked us to really take this on was because about five years ago, a lot of our funders who, again, a grant making in the democracy space, were detecting that there was a disconnect in the words that they were saying and how their grantees or the communities they work with were hearing them. And they were frankly worried and concerned that possibly there was an element of elitism in the language and is there a jargon element that we need to be more cognizant of? A lot of questions came up that way and we started to look into it for them in 2019. Now, over those last five years, obviously we've seen language take a very interesting turn for many of us. And really the way the question comes to us now from our funders is that the coded and loaded nature of civic terms has become untenable. Are there even words I can say anymore? And so if you think back to what it meant to say the word democracy or patriotism 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, to what it feels like to say it now, that is what our members were detecting also. And we're asking us to look into it and help us understand it a little bit more. And so we did. 
And we did a couple rounds of surveys. The most recent one is what we're going to look at today and look into the analysis of today. So in November of 2023, we, in partnership with Citizen Data, who's a fantastic data agency that really works on citizen civic related topics, um, they worked with us to get a nationally representative sample of 5,000 registered U.S. voters surveyed in November of 2023. A um, couple of things I want you to note there. Um, this was, again, November of 2023. So this was, um, you know, an election month, but not a major election year. Um, we were, you know, about a, two years out from vaccines being rolled out, about three years out from the pandemic. You know, we were some time away from January 6th, but obviously still a lot going on in the world. And so that is kind of the headspace that the survey respondents were in, if you can kind of think back to November of 2023. The other piece I want you to know as context is that we did make a filter for the participation in the survey that folks were registered U.S. voters. That was a design choice such that it could map against some of the previous surveys we had done. Um, so just have that in mind. You know, this is not a survey that's telling us how every American thinks about things. It's how every U.S. voter who's registered. This is a national representative sample of that group. We know the far majority of Americans are registered to vote. So it does give us a pretty good pulse on the larger American picture. But I do feel a responsibility to just call out these are registered U.S. voters. So just keep that in mind as you look at the data with us. So what did we survey? Let me show you that in three parts. The first part here is in the um, light purple box. These are the words, probably the thing you're most interested in. What words did we survey? So we had 21 sur uh, words that we surveyed, and we clustered them in three groups of seven. We tried our best to do it thematically. You may have chosen different words to go into different clusters, and that's okay. We mostly were trying to put together some words such that each respondent was looking at those seven words and answering the question questions in the survey for those seven words. We would have loved to get everyone to answer all 21 questions on 21 words, but decision fatigue is real, survey fatigue is real, so they each saw seven. If a word is bolded on the slide, it is because we also tested that word in 2021 when we surveyed before the 2023 one, and then word that's unbolded is brand new, so new, new um, data and analysis for us in this round, which is great. On the bottom part of this slide, these are the demographics that we captured. These are the identities and experiences that people answered about themselves in the survey. And this provides us all the different inroads to cut the data in very interesting and nuanced ways. Again, if it's bolded, it's because we captured that demographic in our 2021 survey. If it's not bolded, that's a new cut available to us in 2023. The third way I want to show you what's in the survey is um, kind of the breakdown of the questions themselves. So there were 49 questions in the survey. A good chunk of them were some of those demographic questions. But when we get into the perception and relationship to words questions, this is what we were trying to uncover. So at the very top, we were really asking people their impression of the word positive, negative, unfamiliar, or neutral. Um, we also asked people to pick what uh, which word is your most positive. We were forcing a choice for our respondents, and then we asked them why. Same on negative, which is your most negative word and why. A big part of the design of this survey was to get underneath people's reasons for having perceptions. We feel like our 2021 survey, we got a sense of perceptions. And this survey, we thought the highest and best use of this asset in research was to really understand some of the why underneath. So we'll be getting into that in a, in a couple minutes. And then there are three areas of relationship to civic terms we also designed the survey to help us understand. One was what was the motivation to action? Does this word motivate you to vote, to stand up for a cause, help others? So we're trying to understand, do these words do something and inspire something in people's behavior and actions? We also were trying to understand who they feel like the term was meant for. Is this meant for you? Is this meant for someone else? You know, gradation in between. 
really they were trying to understand the level of ownership that our survey respondents had for these words. And then lastly, and probably I think probably most of top of mind for many of the people that this survey um, was meant to serve was really trying to understand the unifying potential. So do you perceive this word to bring people together or drive people apart? And how are you experiencing that in your own lived life? Um, so these are the words. We also do have a, the last, very last question, which I'll get into towards the end, was a definitional question. So you'll notice here when we ask people their impressions of words, we were not defining them. And that was on purpose because while it does matter how people define, let's say, democracy and telling us if they're positive or negative or unfamiliar or whatnot with that word, in some ways it also doesn't matter what someone's definition is because we're trying to understand their perceptions of the word. So we do at the tail end of the survey ask folks to define one of three words. We'll get into that analysis in a minute. Um, but on the whole, this is kind of the, this is what we have available the universe of levers available to us in understanding Americans' perceptions of civic terms. So with that as context, um, I'd love to warm up the crew. What I'd love to do is just have you take a look at these 21 words. Again, these are the 21 words that were in our survey. And I'm going to ask a couple questions, and you can go ahead and put your guess into the chat. And let me know what you think Americans stood on these words. Um, so take a minute and, and let them wash over you. And I want to ask you as a first question, which word do you think were respondents overall most positive term? I'll let you know some of the other times I've done this warm up. We've heard community. We have seen, of course, unity be a very positive word. Uh, democracy. These are service. These are some of the ones that typically come up. Um if you were going to put in a word and that word, your guess was going to be freedom, you would be correct. Um, the respondent's most overall positive word was freedom. And it wasn't just a small, most positive word. 88% of survey respondents were positive on the term freedom. Just to be clear, you could only pick freedom, you could only pick positive, negative, neutral, unfamiliar, you had to pick one. You couldn't select all that applied. So 88% of respondents said. Freedom was my number one most positive. So that's really interesting. We heard that freedom was overall most positive. What was the overall most negative word? Um, okay. I'm seeing one answer that said that we thought maybe patriotism was a negative response. Patriotism is a really good guess. Um, I'll go ahead and let you know that the that that word has a lot of sub stories that we should get into at some point. But for the overall most negative word, it was social justice, um, mm. which I think is maybe a surprise for some folks looking at the fullness of this list. Um, but I also want to name is 21 percent of survey respondents were negative on social justice. So it was the highest rate of negativity across all these 21 words, obviously quite different than 88 percent positive on freedom. But the most negative word was social justice. Kind of, um, of a piece, I'm also seeing equity and diversity um, in people's comments. Yep. Yep. And then Guesses. bipartisan community and American. Although I think that person said positive for that one. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all, you're all in the right, you're all in the right vicinity here. Let's go to the next one of most unfamiliar. So which word do you think Americans told us they most were unfamiliar with? What comes up for folks? Bridging, I see. Yep, Diane, I see it now. Racial equity, republic, good guesses. You're in the right vicinity for sure. And I'm going to give it to Diane, who, who nailed it on the head right away. Bridging was actually the most unfamiliar term in our list uh, at 21% respondents were, 21% uh, of respondents were unfamiliar on that word. The last question to warm us up, Remember I told you that we surveyed some words in 2021 and some words in 2023, we retested them. Well, there are 11 words that we retested are now on the list still. I'm curious what your guess would be for which of these 11 words had the biggest increase in net positivity in two years. Diversity, good guess. Democracy, civility. These are great guesses. Civic engagement, belonging, citizen. <laughs> I love ending on this one because few people have ever gotten it. The number one, the biggest increase in net positivity in two years was liberty. And it was 20 percentage point increase in two years. And I'll get into that more in a minute. Um, 
but appreciate you guys kind of warming up with us. I've done these presentations a bunch and when we warm up, it always goes better when you have a chance to let your brain into the word set itself. So let's go into the data. What I thought I could do is start with sharing kind of five findings that we think are really important that you see from our language perception data. And then I wanna talk into a little bit more of uh, the application of our research. So the five findings. So what you're looking at here is the most basic snapshot of Americans' perceptions of the terms themselves. The purple bar is positivity. The orange bar is negativity. Unfamiliarity is in yellow and neutrality is in gray. And we have labeled the positive and negative percentages. The words are also listed at the top from highest positivity down to lowest positivity. And so I often find graphs like this, you know, whoa, it's a lot of colors, it's a lot of bars. It's almost better to zoom out and kind of see what pattern is emerging for you. And here's a couple things that I see. Overall, I see a lot of purple. And I think that is probably our number one biggest finding is that overall Americans are mostly positive on civic terms. And we see very, you know, it, especially relatively, we see less orange, less negativity. So this is an important, I think, takeaway. I also don't see a lot of yellow. A lot of unfamiliarity is not part of the story here. We, of course, see a little more unfamiliarity towards the bottom on words like civic engagement, bipartisan, and bridging. Um, but we also don't see necessarily, it's like there's a lot of kind of unknownness there. You know, you look at a word like bridging, we've got a lot of unfamiliarity and a lot of neutrality, but we only have negativity at 4% and positivity at 34%. So there's just a lot of unknownness there that Americans are signaling to us. But overall, not a ton of unfamiliarity, which, you know, I talk mostly to civic groups and I'm always like, good job, guys. We've got it. People know what a lot of these words are right now, which is great. The other thing I want to point out is that in 2021, when we were doing this research, and we had 21 words then, 11 of which are the same in the same cohort as we are doing this time around, but no matter which way we cut the words in 2021, unity was always the top. And now we see it about middle of the road here. And unity was always the most positive word and all the demographic cuts, all like we cut it like three times, it would still be unity. And it was, it was top at like 71%. And now we're seeing numbers in the 80s that we just did not see in 2021. And so that was a really big takeaway for us at the team at Pace was, whoa, all of a sudden we're seeing a different story emerge here. And there's something really interesting about that. So let's look into that a little bit more. The second finding that we think is really interesting to see is that all perceptions of civic terms got more positive in two years. Now, a little backdrop here is that when we were designing the 2023 survey, we weren't even sure if we should, quote unquote, waste the real estate on testing words again. We were like, what could possibly change in perceptions of terms in two years, particularly the last two years, 2021, 2022? Like, why would we waste the, the real estate on that? Let's go use it to learn new, interesting things about civic language. And we really wrestled with it as a team and decided, you know what, let's just do some retesting and we'll see what comes out. But I think we were bracing for holding steady or seeing declines. So when we got this analysis back, we were shocked. We were really surprised to see this kind of increase happen just in two years' time. Now, there's two words on this graph, of course, that are not showing big strides and in increase, unity and diversity. They are so close to or within our margin of error of 1.4 that we're calling them pretty much a hold steady. But we're seeing, like we said during the warm-up, liberty, 20 percentage points increase in two years. This is a really interesting storyline for us. And we've been mostly in the market of hypothesis harvesting right now. So like, what, what are some of the best thought leaders out there? What other trends and reports are people seeing that might help us understand why this increase happened? And I'll just name a couple that have emerged in the course of the last six months of us having this out in the world. One is that, um, you know, 2021, so the orange dots, uh, remember where we were in November of 2021. We were 10 months out from January 6th. The vaccines had not even been out for a full year. There was a lot of upheaval in the world and certainly within our democratic 
you know, our democratic um, space. And so there is a hypothesis out there that actually the 2021 numbers are slightly lower than would be considered otherwise the norm. Anything that looked like, smelt like, walked like democracy and civic life was maybe hitting lower than it would normally. And that the 2023 numbers in the purple dot are actually something that might be a little bit more close to a, a normal bottom line. And so TBD, you know, we would have to do another testing probably next year in 25 to see if we're seeing upward trajectories or what. But um, I think that's an interesting hypothesis that people have surfaced. Another one is that we actually are more positive. Congrats. <laughs> you know, like we have actually increased the positivity of um, Americans, especially American voters, relationships, to these words, and the civic field has done what it's been trying to do and really helping Americans embrace these terms. And we are more positive. And maybe we are more entrenchedly positive, meaning my definition of liberty has gotten more positive and your definition of liberty has gotten more positive, but our definitions are splintering and are moving further apart. And so that has also been a hypothesis out there. Another piece that we really wanted to see, which will get us to our next finding, is were, were all groups driving this positivity at the same rate or were there some sub-stories in the demographics that we needed to pay attention to? And so we ran some analysis on that. And just to give you a glimpse into that, we pulled uh, groups, some groups by race, by age, by politics, and by community, as well as if folks had taken, remember having civic education or not having civic education in high school. So these were questions in our survey available to us. And we pulled to see, did these groups get more positive on the terms overall in two years? And make no mistake, all groups got more positive. Even the the most, the even the lowest dot, very conservatives, were 3.5% more, more positive in two years on the 11 terms overall. But there are some groups that actually did drive the positivity increase more than others. And we're a little surprised by these groups and feeling like this is a really interesting storyline that is emerging and kind of revealing itself to us in the civic field. So 18 to 34 year olds were one of the groups that drove the positivity increase in the two years. Folks without civic education, really interesting to see that. Also in the population density, all the way by the by community section, we see the poles of population density being drivers in a way that the suburban group was not a driver of the positivity increase. So just a lot of interesting things to explore here. And I think really, um, I would say pretty hopeful, particularly seeing the young people being one of the groups that's driving the increase, uh, pretty hopeful about the ways that we um, think about our democracy and its future. So the fourth finding we want to share with you is going to get us to some of those why questions. Why do you hold a perception you do of your term? And so just to walk you through the survey experience again for respondents, they were asked of the seven terms that they saw in their cluster, which one are you most positive on and which one are you most negative on? And when they answered those questions, a couple of options uh, emerged about why. But what's important to know that they were inverses of each other. So why are you most positive on this word? Because it may, because it aligns with my personal values on the negative side, because it does not align with my personal values. This word makes me feel hopeful about the future. This word makes me feel fearful about the future. My friends and community and family portray this term in a positive light. My friends, family, and community portray this word in a negative light. So all the way down the list, you can kind of see the inverses of each other. And we went ahead and, and did an analysis on all the reasons that all respondents were negative or positive on the term that they selected, no matter what that term was. And we tried to understand where are we seeing Americans telling us their relationships to these words are being shaped or why they have these perceptions of the terms. And so here's what we see when we look at a graph like this. On the positive side, so on the purple side, we see that Americans are telling us their relationships to the words, their perceptions of the words are being mostly positively shaped by their sense of something internal. So they're feeling like this word aligns with their personal values. They are feeling that a word makes them feel hopeful about the future. There's something internal happening. On the negative side, however, we see that the words are making people feel fearful about the future is why they may have selected a word as negative. But very interestingly, looking at the bottom, because port politicians portray this word in a negative light, not to be outdone by the media portraying it in a negative light. And so we see a different story emerging here where folks' negative perceptions of terms are being shaped by external factors where the positive 
term, the positive perceptions are being shaped by internal factors more drivingly. Um, so there's a ton more to look into here, and we have been cutting it, including like confidence using the term and which words do Americans feel more confident using and is that shaping positive or negative perceptions of it. There's a whole ocean of other analysis that we've been digging into. Um, but we think the headline of the politicians and the media influence on the negative side and a very different story on the positive side is something that's really worth taking a minute to think through. The last thing I want to show you in terms of the five major findings is a sense of which identities make a difference in our civic language perceptions. So again, let me give you a little backstory on the graph you're looking at here. So what we did was we tried to understand, okay, are there certain demographics, are there certain identities that we look through or we may lead with that might shift our ability to connect with people in our perceptions of civic language? And we tested that by taking overall positivity of all 21 words for one group and comparing it to overall positivity of all 21 words for another group within the same demographic category. Now, obviously not all demographic categories give us polls to kind of play off each other, but what we did is we tried to pick two groups that through other research we see in the field typically may be showing us a difference and to see if that's also true in civic language. So for example, we took overall positivity of all 21 words of people who said they were very liberal and overall positivity of people of all 21 words of people who said they were very conservative. And we said, what is the difference in those positivity rates? And the difference is 22.4 percentage points. We did the same for Democrats and Republicans. We see 17.3% and down the line. And what we sit with here is that there is a very big difference when we are leading with our political identities and how we perceive the civic terms than when we're leading with other identities. If we're leading with our gender identity, for example, at the bottom of this graph, there's only about a 6% difference in how you may perceive a term from somebody who's a different gender from you. But on the political side, it's three times that. And so we know that people are trying to figure out how to bridge across difference. And this data tells us kind of what we know in other data, but really applied in the civic language space is that some bridges are shorter than others to cross. If we continue to lead with our political identities, it will be harder. But we have assets here. And these are our other identities, including our racial identities, which I know sometimes can feel quite polarizing, including our age and generational um, identities, which also can feel at odds at times. So this we feel like is a very important data piece for us to see and to, again, recognize that there are other ways that we can be thinking about civic language outside of our political identities that might make a difference. So um, we want to also make sure folks see the political signals that the terms send, knowing that our political identities are making such a difference in the um, perceptions of the words. And so again, a graph like this, best to zoom out and let your eyes kind of catch on to the patterns that emerge. And let me go ahead and point out some of the patterns. Um, also, let me say as context, these are all the 21 words in alphabetical order from left to right. And within each graph, you're looking at folks uh, very liberal, somewhat liberal, moderate, somewhat conservative, very conservative, unsure, kind of repeated for each word. So what you're seeing is the most liberal at the top and the more conservative at the bottom and, you know, kind of living through the spectrum that way. So here are some patterns I would draw your attention to. Um, first, we see a cluster of words, for example, um, American patriotism and republic. These are words that we see smaller positivity on the liberal side of things and getting more positive as you get more conservative. Um, the same is also true on negative. It's more negative on the liberal side of things and it gets less negative as you get more conservative. And so these are words that are sending pretty conservative signals when you use them. I think the data bears that out in, in what we see here. The other, the next I want you to see are the, the words that are doing the inverse of that. So advocacy, diversity, racial equity, and social justice. We see words that are more positive on the liberal side of things getting less positive as they are growing more conservative with a similar pattern on the negative side, um, getting more negative as you get more conservative. And so these words we would say are sending liberal signals. And then there's words like belonging, freedom, and service, where you look at the pattern of those three and there's not that much variance and particularly not that much variance within the um, 
political ideologies. And where I think these words stick out to me is that we see the highest positivity in the somewhats. So the somewhat liberal and the somewhat conservative being the most positive areas of belonging on freedom and on service. Um, interestingly, none of these words are moderates the most positive on. Um, I love our moderates, right? They're just very moderate about being moderate. Um, but here, I think when you see the very liberal and the very conservatives on either side of the moderates, that's a story, I think, of um, a political signal that is has the potential to span across different political ideologies. So I'll pause there. Um, you know, our data can be a lot for the brain to take on. I'll pause there and check in with Caitlin and see if there's any questions that have come through the chat or the Q&A that, that I can help to answer while we take a little bit of a, a minute here to process. Sure. Um, we had a great question and you touched on it um, to some extent, but maybe you can elaborate. Um, the question says, just because because terms are viewed positively doesn't mean that individuals um, don't define them very differently. In fact, maybe very differently. So how were you accounting for or accommodating for that? Or did you? Yep. Um, a little a little yes, a little no. So in the yes column, we're going to go into some analysis where we have been deep into the weeds of the three words that we did ask definitions for, democracy, civic engagement, or racial equity. Particularly the word democracy, given where we are in the election season, has been a major area of interest for our field. And so I'm going to go and share some of that. And the distinctions between definitions is very important, I think, for us to see. So we have a whole slide on that. Um, but I would say back to what I said earlier, in many ways, it doesn't totally matter when we're asking people their perceptions of the words if if like we're defining it differently, because part of perceptions is also like the emotional experience, right? Like when you hear the word democracy, are you positive or are you negative? And it almost doesn't matter if I'm taking five, six, seven, eight words after the word democracy to define it or not, you've already had your emotional response. And so there was something we were trying to understand there too. It's like kind of like a knee jerk, like how do you initially, what is your impression of this word absent of even the definition of it? Thank you for going into some greater detail. Awesome. Great. Wonderful. So how to talk bridgy. This is a term we have made up ourselves at Pace, but it is one that we feel like need that has the potential to be embraced because I think there is a lot of effort in the, at least the spaces that we operate in around bridging, bridging across divide, you know, really thinking about how we tackle and mitigate polarization right now. And in many ways, I think we have overlooked some of the lowest hanging fruit available to us, which is just the words that we say. And is there a skill set out there that our research illuminates to help people learn how to talk bridgier? And so we've started to coalesce around some principles and some lessons there that I'm going to start to share some insight to uh, with you all here. Another way we're thinking about this is what to say on November 6th. Everyone's talking about November 5th. Obviously, it's a big election day. But what do we say to each other on November 6th? When no matter which way you vote or which way the candidate the election goes, we will have just finished a pretty intense season of political rivalry in the United States. And so how do we start to talk in a way that we can connect to people within and beyond ourselves and our communities to be bridgier? So let me share some thoughts on that with you all. So first, what makes a word bridgy? How would we even define what is a bridgy word? And make no mistake, we have a lot of options available to us in the way we surveyed, we designed the survey. And we had to take a real beat to be like, wait, which criteria do we want to lean on to define what would make a word bridgy? So here are the choices we made in our own data about what makes a word bridgy. So I'll say it first in kind of layman's terms and then in technical terms for folks who are more um, want to understand it from the survey perspective. So first, people generally agree that they like the word. That's an important ingredient to a word being bridgy. Um, technically, on, on the survey side of things, that means a word has a high net positivity. So that's positivity minus negativity. We're getting kind of the purest positivity there. And there was very little net po net positivity variance within demographic groups. So when we looked at that chart with like 22% positivity difference between liberals and conservatives on the words overall, we looked at that analysis one level deeper on words themselves to see what the differences were across nine different demographic uh, categories. And we developed a composite from that. So again, that's for my technical folks in the audience. 
But that didn't feel like enough, right? It's not just that people agreed they liked the word. We also felt like we had this interesting and unique insight into people's understanding and perception and experience of a word being polarizing or not. And we feel like that is also another ingredient. So we we are also leaning on whether or not people perceive the word to be polarizing. And, and in our definition of Bridgie, that they do not see the word as polarizing. So on the technical side of things, uh, we leaned on the question that asked people if they experienced the word to be polarizing. And we were looking for low rates of people saying this word drives people apart a lot or drives people apart a little. So any version of drives people apart, if it had a low rate, that meant the word was bridgy. If it had a high rate, that meant the word was not so bridgy. So people generally agree they like the word and they do not perceive it to be polarizing. That's a bridgy word in our definition. So they have words that have broad appeal and are not perceived to be polarizing. So which words how do the words fare in that in that criteria? So here I'm just showing you, uh, I think it's the 10 words that we wanted to highlight, particularly from an election perspective. If you're interested in how all 21 words fare, we're going to be releasing a report next month and that will have the fullness there. Um, but just to say... In each of these, the three criteria are listed in column. And what we did is we ranked each word one to 21 if they were where they were on the net positivity ranking, on the average range, and on the drive apart ranking, and then added those rankings to get a score. So again, pretty technical here. But what I want you to walk away from a graph like this is that our most bridgy word here is liberty. Uh, our least bridgy word here is republic. And so you can kind of see there are some words that are rising to the top for us, and there are some some words that are rising down below. Now we asked, we get asked a lot, so should I stop saying least bridgy words? And I will, I'm going to put a strong request that we do not stop saying non-bridgy words, because even the non-bridgy words have a lot of asset. They are in our orbit. They are important words to our democracy. I think it's more about understanding what signals these words do send, figuring out how Americans relate to them, in some cases how they define them, and knowing how to use the words more sophisticatedly, but not to then totally let go of the words. One of the things that a lot of our um, practitioners in the civic field tell us, you know, take the word democracy, for example, a lot of signals are being sent by the word democracy right now, which we'll get into in a minute. And I think there's a big movement of folks who are like, so we're going to stop saying democracy. And I have been like this massive voice saying, guys, we cannot stop saying democracy. If we stop saying democracy, A, who picks it up or who already is starting to pick it up? And B, we are the current stewards of the American experiment right now. And I think there's a responsibility for us to infuse certain meanings into words with our actions such that future generations have these words available to them as they are then stewarding the American experiment. So I think that there's a, a large conversation happening, particularly in the civic field from a language perspective, about where some of these words have gotten coded and loaded and the signals are getting hard to navigate. And so they're just not using them. And there's a whole other conversation about the unintended consequences of that and how important it is that we really work triple hard to give these words the sort of meaning that we think the American experiment relies on for them long term. Another thing I want you to see in How to Talk Bridgie is that, that we've been kind of coalescing around this reflection as we've been in our analysis about how it's a tough time to be a word right now, particularly in America, arguably everywhere, but definitely in America, and how important elaboration is to talking Bridgie. And so like I've referenced a couple times in this presentation, the last question of our survey, Q49, respondents were given one of three words. It was whatever word was their cluster word, civic engagement, democracy, or racial equity. And they were asked to describe it. How do you define this word? And so we have this really rich data set of Americans' elaborations, their own words of these particular terms. And we're able to cut that with a whole bunch of different demographics. And it's just been a really fascinating area of research for us. But what I want you to think about and what we have been thinking a lot about here is how many words it's taken people to elaborate on these terms. So for a word like civic engagement, on average, it's taken the average survey respondent nine words to define civic engagement. And just to give you a visual, here's civic engagement. Here's how many other words people needed to define it. Needed about three and a half more civic engagements. For racial equity, 
We see that number go up a little bit. The average number of words was 11 in those definitions. And it took folks about four and a half more racial equities to define racial equity. And then really interestingly, democracy, it took 11 words on average for people to elaborate on that word. And so 10 more democracies to make sense of it. For one person, it took them 155 more democracies to define democracy. And so we just have been really taking a moment to pause and reflect on the ways that our world and our communication structures and systems have really incentivized brevity and quippiness and just being as economical as possible with words to the point where we have asked these words to carry so much now, right? They're carrying so much um, weight and pressure. They are asked to represent full belief systems, full value systems, full lived experiences. And I would argue these words aren't really designed to do that. And so understanding what people mean when they say these words, we have seen be some of the most important skills in terms of, in ter terms of talking Bridgie. Let's go into that a little bit more on the word democracy itself. So we went deep into all the words, but when we look at the democracy definitions, there were six themes that emerged across all the definitions. Um, and these are this really tells us how American voters understand democracy. And just to kind of walk you through what you see on your screen here, in the definitions, there was a lot of mention of government by the people, and that's how power is derived. It is from the people. There was a lot of talk about equal representation and rights, equal, equal right to vote, express opinions and participate. We saw a lot about freedom and autonomy, freedom of speech. Um, obviously, you know, not a surprise, I think, that elections came up in people's definitions of democracy um, and the ways in which citizens can influence um, governmental decisions. Uh, we saw a lot about accountability, um, particularly the ways that leaders are accountable to the people and, and should see that as a reason to be ethical in their um, in their decision making. And then also inclusivity, um, the ways that democracy allows various voices to be heard. And one person even said even the average person has a say. So these are the kind of basic tenets of what came up as, you know, emerging themes across all definitions of democracy. But here are some very important de definitional distinctions. This gets back to the earlier question that um, our friend wrote in, but the we kind of looked at it from a lot of different directions. And these are the three I want to talk about the most here with you. So by race. When we look at how folks who are identified as Hispanic, Asian, Black, and white, self-identified in their racial question, and then looked at how they defined the word democracy, we saw some important distinctions. So the Hispanic respondents, there was a lot of emphasis in their definitions on equality and coming together for the common good. There was skepticism in many of the definitions, and it was really centering around democracy in practice is not representative. So kind of a disconnect between what the hope of democracy is and what the lived experience is. For folks who identified as Asian, the emphasis in their definitions is really on participation and engagement, really kind of stepping up and stepping into democracy as a role of the citizen, and highlighted a lot on the importance of fair elections that was coming up a lot in those definitions. For folks who identified as Black, emphasis in those definitions was on social equality, and the skepticism that emerged in their elaborations was really, again, democracy in practice is not inclusive. So again, naming that there is a disconnect in lived experience and maybe the ideal of democracy. And then for folks who identified as white, I think this is super important for us to take into account. The emphasis in their definitions were on historical and constitutional details. There was a lot of talk about the Constitution in their definitions. And skepticism in their understanding of democracy was really around a sense of corruption in the system. So just a very different interpretation of democracy. In many ways, all of these folks had themes that we talked about on the last slide, but these nuances emerge that we think are really important to understanding um, how people kind of connect with each other and into these terms. Another area we looked is, you know, of course, we had we asked people their impressions of the word democracy. So we said, okay, for everyone who said they were positive on democracy, how are they defining the term? And for everyone who said they were negative on the word democracy, how are they defining the term? And here's what we see when we look at that data. So folks who were positive on the word democracy, they were speaking to a kind of lived experience that was positive uh, about democracy. And they were really kind of centering their definitions around seeing democracy as a tool to give people, all people, an equal voice, regardless of background. 
On the negative side, there was a little bit more venting happening in those definitions. And there was a clear negative lived experience of democracy for those folks. And they saw democracy as a tool for government control, uh, select, you know, only serving a select few. They talked a lot about elected officials, about the wealthy. That came up a lot in the definitions. And really interestingly, as a difference between these two groups' definitions, on the positive side, there was actually very little mention of political parties. There was much more focus in their definitions on larger principles or of democracy. On the negative side, there was significant mention, not just of political parties, but of specific political parties. And so we think it's really interesting the way that partisanship is showing up in people's definitions of democracy. And particularly for those of us that work in the civic space, we're really thinking about the relationship between democracy and politics and partisanship. And we are seeing that Americans are struggling with where one begins and where one ends. Um, that felt really clear when we looked at this analysis. And then lastly, this won't be a total surprise, but I want to use this as a lead into my next slide, is how do people who identified as liberal and people who identified as conservative differ in their definitions? Um, I think a lot of people are pretty comfortable with this distinction at this point, but on the liberal side, uh, folks were really expressing the value of democracy as a tool for advancing social justice and equality, and the criticism on their end of the current system is the lack of representation and the system of inequalities that they detected. On the conservative side, democracy was really expressed um, as a way of protecting personal freedoms and individual rights. And the criticism really centered on um, government overreach and the loss of personal freedoms. But why I wanted to share that was because what we did was we wanted to see, well, are there words that were coming up for some groups but not others? And where, where, what is the frequency in which words were used depending on the political ideology? And so at the top here, we see the divided words. This is where, how, how much were words being used by the different political parties on either side, excuse me, political ideologies on either side? And do we see a difference there? And what I think is so fascinating about this top graph is that the first breath that people are using to define democracy is not that different by political ideology. People's number one on both sides, right? They are using the word people to define democracy. That is a very present value in the definition of democracy, no matter the political ideology. And then we're seeing democracy and we're seeing government. You know, obviously a slightly different order on the conservative and the liberal sides, but they're both the top three words. It's the second breath where things get really interesting. So on the liberal side, the next three words are vote, system, and citizens. On the conservative side, the next three words are freedom, country, and vote. So we see a different story emerging in the second breath, but I feel like we have to remember our first breath is pretty similar and we have a lot of common ground. Obviously there are nuances there and there's differences of opinion, but I feel very encouraged to know that across political ideologies, we are very aligned in where we start. It is where we go second that we have differences of opinion. And we see a similar theme emerge on the bottom graph here, the missing words. So these are words that did not show up in the other political ideologies definitions. So on the liberal side, they were saying words like chosen, branches, decided, governance. I it's really interesting to see I love like love here, right? Like love was showing up in liberal definitions. Um, they did not show up in conservative definitions. On the conservative side, we see words that didn't show up on the liberal side as American citizens. We're seeing the constitutional thread here, constitutional, constitutional republic, protect, very different kind of vibe of words that were very present in the conservative definitions, not at all present in the liberal definitions. So really interesting to see, I think, this analysis here. So that's that's kind of the big step. I'll take another pause, and then we do have one more section if time allows. Um, sure. Well, I do see there's a question that has been in the Q and A for a while. Um, how would you suggest communications professionals utilize this research and the findings? Mm, wow. Thank you for that question. Nobody asks me that. <laughs> I. It's a great question. I think that. Um. I. Do not this this research was not designed with the intention of a do and do not list, right? Like we did not want to be leaving our 
um, research and say, okay, we did the research and here are the 10 words to say, and these are the 10 words not to say, good luck. That's not the point here. The point here is to get more sophisticated in knowing which words carry meaning, weight, positive perceptions, in some cases, negative perceptions with the groups that you're trying to reach. And so we have really held a pretty descriptive posture with this research. And other groups have picked up our research and been more prescriptive about it. And we think that's wonderful. That's kind of the point. Um, but in terms of what communications professionals might do with this research is get more sophisticated in it. You know, I think our, our research is designed to let you know this word probably will fly with these groups and be quite effective. This word probably will not. Um, there is a tool, if we have time to go into, there's, a, there's an AI tool we've leaned on that has been offering us some rewrites um, their data match so closely to our data that we've been leaning on this tool to help us rewrite how might we say this more bridgier. And there we have been really building our capacity because in very few cases has it been eliminating any of our words. It's just putting other words around it to signal to value systems that we're trying to reach. And in our case, bridginess, we're trying to reach both conservative and liberal ears and their value systems. So how can you say that? In very few cases, is that tool telling us to take out the word democracy, take out the word racial equity? Instead, it's saying, hold on to those words and put these words around it so that it can be heard in an intentional way. So again, it's kind of a hard question to answer because it depends on who you're trying to reach and what you're trying to do. Um, but I think our research is, is a very rich foundation to jump off from for that. So we did do a couple of case studies, this is to say, um, about how to talk Bridgie. We've worked with a couple groups who are trying to talk about different concepts and really kind of use our research, use some of our tools to help them say it Bridgie and what do we take away from it. Um, and so, like I said, we've been leaning on this tool, Pluralytics. It, it'll read any piece of content. You go ahead and copy and paste anything into the site. It'll score it against who it reaches, and then it'll suggest rewrites to improve engagement. And so we um, have a partnership with them, and we've been granted 50 seats that different civic leaders have been using for the last six months. And we co-designed five benchmarks. So Gen Z, rural, bridginess by politics, bridginess by race, and bridginess by age. So again, I can take something off of Pace's website, put it into the into Pluralytics and say, is this bridgy by politics? And it'll say yes or no. And what's showing me is the graph at this top here. And it it doesn't, it's not telling me, hey, conservatives like this, liberals don't like this or whatever. Instead, it has this whole language science where it's breaking down different five major value systems. And this is based on consumer data um, and audience segmentation. And in, in order to hit a bridginess, I need to hit all of those red lines. That's the bridginess benchmark that we developed with Pluralytics. And you can see whatever content I put in here does not meet that benchmark. So you can ask it to rewrite and it'll get you a sense of well, here's how you can get there better. Um, so we did a bunch of case studies um, on trying to optimize for the bridginess by politics. And um, I was going to walk through one here um, and I'll do it very quickly, but this was a, um, a Shift Family Foundation, one of our members. They are running um, in a democracy, a learning and action collaborative. And so this on, on this purple block here, this is exactly off their website. And you can see the they use the word democracy twice. And we ran it through five times. We asked it to rewrite five times. You know, it does not hit the bridginess benchmark, but we asked it to rewrite five times to see what would it take to get this language to Bridgie. And I'll spare you all the different cuts of it, but here's here are the two big lessons we learned from that case study. First of all, in all the cases, it actually got to democracy faster. In all the rewrites, democracy ended up being like the first or second word, not the eighth or ninth word. And it was really interesting to us because, again, we are operating on this idea of like, ooh, democracy, kind of coded and loaded, probably doesn't hit all these value segments. It's probably going to edit it out and try to say it with different words. And each time it was trying to get it there faster. Um, so we think that's really interesting. It did, it did maintain a lot of this data or sorry, a lot of this language, but where it was trying to increase the hearthy voice, and that's the value segment that maps most closely to conservative value system. There are folks who are focused on um, they they take a lot of stock in family, they take a lot of stock in tradition, they take a lot of stock in spirituality and religion. So where it was increasing on the hearthy was it was trying to eliminate a lot of the jargon in this text. So where it says in the second sentence, it has been co-designed with practitioners, it changed that to professionals. Um, there's a phrase in here, typically siloed fields, it switched it to traditionally separate sectors. And where it says desire to collaborate, it changed it to share a vision of working together. 
So again, it wasn't eliminating the words, wasn't changing the meaning. It's not trying to change the meaning. It's just trying to help language not get in the way. And in order to get this to be bridgier, it was helping us take some of the jargon out and say it in language that would hit a more tradition focused value system. The kind of juicy part, Caitlin, I would say is this lightning round where we went ahead and took three kind of pretty popular, I'm sure you'll know all of these quotes or uh, passages and put them through um, pluralytics to see if they're bridgy and if not what a rewrite would look like. I will spare you the details of my 1 a.m. like rabbit hole in pluralytics where I was just putting everything I could think of through it. But these are some good ones that came out. Um, so let me show you the Pledge of Allegiance. We all remember the Pledge of Allegiance. Some of us still say it if you work in school systems or in other agencies. Um, I would normally ask you to guess if this is, if you think this is bridgy, I will save you because of time. It is not bridgy, according to Pluralytics, but here's the rewrite that makes it bridgy. I swear my devotion to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic it embodies, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and equality for all. So again, meaning is not changed here drastically. It's just about changing the language such that it'll appeal to more of those value segments we looked at earlier. And here's a couple shifts that it made in order to do that. It cha changed, I pledge allegiance to, I swear my devotion. It changed which it stands to, it embodies. And it changed liberty and justice to liberty and equality for all. I think really interestingly, it did not remove one nation under God, didn't remove God, kept that in, that keeps it hurt, that keeps it bridgy. Um, and so this is kind of the, the offered rewrite from Pluralytics. Another one I wanted to look at was ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Very famous JFK quote. Um, for those of you playing at home, this one is bridgy. Um, it does pass the score for bridginess politically, uh, probably why it has stood the test of time, I might suppose. Um, it does not pass for Gen Z, and it does not pass for rural. So this is just to say, all because it makes sense in one goal and objective, like bridginess, it may not make sense in other goals and objectives, like trying to reach Gen Z. So just a little note there. Um, and then lastly, an MLK Jr. quote, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Um, this one does not hit for Bridgie. Here is the rewrite that Pluralytics Suggest does. I envision a time when this nation will stand together and honor the essential truth that all people are created equal. So just some notes of change here. It shifted rise up to stand together. It shifted live out the meaning of its creed to honor essential truth. And you might have noticed this right away. It shifted all men are created equal to all people are created equal, um, which I co-sign. Um, so that is what gets it bridgy. And so with that, I just want to say thank you for having us. I'm sorry I didn't leave too much time for conversation, but I'm very available over email if there's follow-up conversation that would be helpful or interesting to folks. And what I have here uh, is the URL. This is the front door to our project. So really anything you want, old webinars that we've done on other slices of the data, um, you can get into the dashboard data yourself. Um, a ton of resources there available to you if you're interested in learning more. And I just really appreciate the opportunity to share this with your audience. Um, thank you so much for sharing. I know we've had a couple of questions of people asking how they could get to more data or um, right. how you were spreading and sharing the word. Um, just to follow up on one of those, we had a question asking if you have written any op-eds to more, you know, share this with more people. Yeah. Um, yes, it's in motion. Um, there's a lot coming forward in this fall. Um, one thing I would make sure this group knew about is that we are providing and just finalizing a how to talk Bridgie resource guide that will come out three weeks before November 6th. So really trying to support people where we've been hearing pretty consistently support is needed. Um, so October 16th, that'll be launching into the world. Um, and then that will likely be kind of um, bringing us to other op-eds, particularly different slices of the data, which, um, you know, we didn't even get into some other like juicy pieces of the data around patriotism and what people mean by racial equity. There's just a lot here. So um, definitely more to come. Wonderful. And one final question in the Q&A, and then I, I think we'll, um, we'll wrap up here. Um, although actually, I am noting um, one person put in the chat, you, you mentioned that you'd be happy to follow up via email and some people were asking how they could get in touch with you. Yeah. Um, Amy at pacefunders.org. 
Thank you so much. Um, so one one final question in the Q and A, um, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Um, Kamala Harris frequently used the term freedom in her acceptance speech. Do you think that when she uses it, does it speak to her voters, and how do non-supporters react? Oh, I love who put this in here because we have been watching her campaign and noting. Someone was like, "Did someone slip her your research?" I'm like, "We're wondering that too because she's." kind of taking a lot of what we found and applying it in really interesting ways. So I I don't know. You know, I don't know what her team is advising her or kind of where she's in the language. Whoever is kind of thinking through language for her campaign, I think is doing a masterful job in leaning on words that are um, going to increase her ability to be bridgy. Now, Freedom is an interesting word. Obviously, it's our most positive word, 88% positivity. Um, it's kind of a word that we don't see a ton of variance on as we look demographics. Like people just agree they like this word. Um, but it's it's a difference between freedom for and or freedom of and freedom to. You know, like there's there's like a there's such difference in that word. I think there could be a whole project just on the word freedom. And so we've been noting like that would be a really good one to get definitional analysis on because I think there's a lot of substory there that's important. Um, but I would say I'm seeing her kind of lean on it as just an initial like hook. Like freedom is a word that uh, Americans agree they really like. So I can hook in people by using it. And then it's been interesting to kind of see how she plays it out. The other word that's been interesting is patriotism. If you've noticed, one of my colleagues has been paying a lot of attention to the way she's using patriotism. For a while, she was just saying love of country, love of country, love of country. And then she started to say love of country like pat and patriotism like together. And now she's like kind of leaning on patriotism. So she is it's, I think there's like an intentionality I'm observing in the way she's trying to infuse meaning into words, particularly words that have started to code conservative. But I think she's trying to either, I think she's trying to make them friendly for a broader audience in a way that they've maybe gotten a little unfriendly to some circles. So I don't know if anyone knows anyone on that campaign that is thinking about this, I would love to hear because I really do think they're being quite masterful with their language choices. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's always good to know that you have something else that you want to study in the next go round um, as well. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. I think this is, uh, has been so informative and interesting. If you want to stay in touch with Planet Word, the best way to do that is to subscribe to our newsletter. That way you'll be the first to hear of all of our upcoming excellent and exciting programs. Um, once again, thank you so much, Amy. Thank you everybody. Have an excellent afternoon.